On this edition of Food for Life, from the Catholic Charismatic Center in Houston, Texas, Father Mark Goring. You know, to be impetuous is to act without thinking. You know, we see Peter, he does that quite a bit, you know. But how would Peter feel that his foibles, his mistakes are published for the whole world to read throughout the ages? We're meant to enter into the mystery of God's love. We're meant to enter into the mystery that God loves us so much that He came, He became man, and He died for us so that we could live forever. And we can enter into this ministry, we, mystery, we can approach this mystery from many different angles. And the angle I'd like to approach it today is from the angle of the experience of the disciples. And in particular, the experience of Peter, of St. Peter. So what I'd like to do today is I would like to speak about St. Peter. In a particular way, I'd like to talk about Peter's, his weakness. And even the ways he messed up. And we can ask ourselves, you know, why, why would we want to focus on Peter's, you know, his faults and, you know, his tendency to have sometimes bad judgment and things like that? Well, two reasons. Number one, the weakness of the disciples, their struggles, their mistakes, the ways they messed up, that's part of the Gospels. You read the Gospels, it's in there. It's part of the Gospels. We're meant to contemplate it. And secondly, it reminds us that there's hope for us. Isn't that right? Like, can you imagine, had the gospel writers chosen to not include the kind of the foibles and the mistakes and the struggles of the disciples, it would have radically changed the character of what we read. You know, the fact that the gospels written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit do include these ways the disciples messed up, were slow to learn, were, were slow to believe sometimes. And that's significant. That's included. It's interesting in the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verse 25, John, he says, There are also many other things that Jesus did, but if, there were to, if they were to, these were to be described individually, I do not think the whole world can contain the books that would be written. Like the Gospels are relatively short. The Gospel writers could have wrote, written all kinds of things. They left a lot out. But yet they chose to include Again, the weaknesses, the struggles of the disciples. Why? Because it's important. Only what was important, what was most important, was, was recorded in the Gospels, including the struggles and the uh, ways the disciples messed up. So they're there for us to contemplate. We're supposed to contemplate these things. Now, some might say, well, how would Peter feel? You know, poor Peter. His mistakes, you know, his, you know they say, Peter suffered from a serious case of foot and, foot and mouth disease, you know? So he's putting his foot in his mouth. You know, the word that's typically used to describe Peter is he's impetuous. You know, to be impetuous is to act without thinking. You know, we see Peter, he does that quite a bit, you know? But how would Peter feel that his foibles, his mistakes are published for the whole world to read throughout the ages? Well, I think that Peter would be glad to know that these have been proclaimed. As a matter of fact, we know that this is what Peter himself proclaimed when he preached the gospel. Mark, the evangelist, was Peter's scribe. Mark wrote the gospel basically according to Peter, the things Peter preached. And Mark includes lots of Peter's faults. 
When Peter preached the gospel, he didn't hide these things. These things were important. They were part of the gospel. Peter proclaimed, yeah, I denied him three times, and he forgave me. It's an important part of the gospel. Peter said, yeah, I walked on water for a bit, took my eyes off Jesus, and then I sunk. I had to cry out to him, and he helped me. That's part of the gospel. Peter proclaimed these things. He wanted the whole world to know. Now, before we get into Peter's faults, I want to begin by highlighting some of his good points. Because they say that's what you're supposed to do, you know. Before you kind of correct someone, you're supposed to affirm them. So that's actually kind of part of the companions of the cross, I don't know, way of relating. It doesn't always work, though, you know. You kind of see it coming, you know. Hey, Mark, I like the way you keep your truck clean, you butter your toast, and you tie your shoes. But you're a lousy preacher, you know. It's like, okay, I, that, that was a tradition kind of back in Ottawa. You, you affirm the person three times, and then you correct them. I remember I'd get emails as a newly ordained priest. You know, dear Father Mark, you know, one affirmation, two affirmations. Like, oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> Another one of these emails. So anyways, it got to a point where, you know, forget the affirmations. Just, just correct me if you have to correct me. But the point is, there's good things to say about Peter. Don't get me wrong. Some of Peter's most glorious moments, you know, the story of Jesus in John chapter 6 when he's proclaiming the Eucharist that we need to eat his flesh and drink his blood. The most perhaps outrageous thing Jesus says, and it says that as a result of this, many of Jesus' disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. They left Jesus. Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to leave me? And this is where Peter rises up, and Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. A glorious moment for Peter. He stands up, he says, I'm not leaving you. You have the words of eternal life. I don't understand what you're saying, but I'm not going to leave you. Another glorious moment for Peter is when Jesus asks, Matthew 16, verse 15, But who do you say that I am? You know, people are saying some John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah. But Jesus says, but you, who do you say that I am? And again, Peter rises up. Simon Peter said in reply, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And then again, maybe one of the greatest points for Peter. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, earth will be loosed in heaven. Another glorious moment for Peter. Or another example is on the day of, of Pentecost. Peter stands up and he preaches the good news. And it says 3,000 people were converted that day. Sure, it was an awesome sermon. In the Acts of the Apostles, we hear about Peter going to places and everyone being healed, people wanting his, even his shadow to touch them so that they could be healed. Imagine. And we know that Peter loved Jesus to the end. Peter died a martyr's death. He preferred to die rather than to renounce Jesus. He died a martyr's death. He was faithful to the end. Surely a great man. But like I mentioned, he had his faults. He had his faults. Let's look at some of them. Again, I already mentioned when Peter was walking on water. Again, there wasn't, the, the Gospels are short. It would have been very easy to kind of leave out the part about Peter falling through. He walks on water. He takes his eyes off Jesus. He falls in. But you know, how many times do we, you know, we get filled with faith, filled with the Spirit, and we walk, we're, we're, we're living in the Spirit, we feel great, we're doing good, and all of a sudden, we sink. Do you feel bad when that happens? Does that happen to you some of the time? Happened to Peter. He had to cry out, Jesus, save me, and Jesus saved him. Thank God that was included in the Gospel. It happens to us all the time. 
right after Jesus gave this great proclamation that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church, I'll give you the gates, the, the keys, the gates of heaven. Jesus tells the disciples, he says, I gotta, be, I gotta go to Jerusalem, I'm gonna be killed. And Peter, you know, with his foot and mouth disease, in Matthew 16, 22, then Peter said to him and began to rebuke him, God forbid, Lord, that such a thing should ever happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an obstacle to me. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. Again, G Jesus can lift us up. Sometimes it's, it's, it's when we're, we're, we're doing best that the Lord will come in and he will, he will correct us. Have you ever been corrected by the Lord? Or the Lord says, hey, you're off track. You're not thinking like God. You're thinking like men. Peter got that more than once. But Jesus didn't give up on him. We know that many times there were solemn moments where Jesus was giving profound teaching. And Peter ended up saying the silliest things. You know when Jesus uh, was transfigured on Mount Tabor and Moses and Elijah appears with him? What's Peter's suggestion? Let's start camping. You know, let's, let's break out a barbecue and, and, you know, make some s'mores. He says, let's, let's, let's put some tents up. And I don't know, maybe, maybe there was some deep biblical theological reason to what Peter says, but if there was, the biblical scholars haven't figured out yet. We don't know what Peter was talking about. Same thing when Jesus was washing his disciples' feet, the solemn moment Jesus takes off his outer garment, and Peter, you're not going to wash my feet. You know, and Jesus says, Peter, you don't know what's going on. And then same thing when Jesus, before he dies, he's speaking again symbolically. He says, if you don't have a sword, you've got to go out and buy one. And Peter says, I've got two swords. Jesus says, enough. But again, how often do we honestly not really understand what God is doing in our life, where we are confused. Is there anything wrong with that? No. Peter, he had trouble understanding. Sometimes it takes time to understand. It did for Peter. We shouldn't be embarrassed when it takes time for us. We know, of course, that Jesus, in his most difficult, troubling moment, he asked Peter, John and James says, stay awake, pray with me. In, the, in the, the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was looking for comfort from his friends, for, for support. He didn't get any from Peter. Peter fell asleep. Peter, why are you sleeping? You ever fall asleep on the Lord when the Lord's counting on you? You don't come through. And of course, Peter denies Jesus three times. says, Jesus, I'll never deny you. And then almost immediately after, denies Jesus three times. How did Peter feel after that? And even after the resurrection, after the, 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 the great preaching of Pentecost, after Peter was doing all his healings, he still wasn't perfect. We know he struggled a bit. He, he, wasn't, he didn't want to offend some of the Jews, so he wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. Paul had to call him on that one. Again, Peter wasn't perfect. And what can we learn from this? Well, first of all, we should not be surprised that the story of our life also includes a lot of mess-ups and faults and foibles and a lot of struggle. Now, some of us were shocked, you know, like, I gave my life to the Lord, but I'm still struggling. We shouldn't be surprised. This has been the first segment of Father Mark Goring's teaching on St. Peter Had Faults Too. For an audio CD or video DVD of this complete teaching, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. When you write, ask for an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Mark Goring on St. Peter Had Faults Too. On the next edition of Food for Life, from the Catholic Charismatic Center in Houston, Texas, Father Mark Goring continues with his teaching on St. Peter Had Faults Too. There's a great virtue in life of being able to keep going, even after you fall, to be able to get up and keep going. 
A person who's able to do that will get far in life. Has anyone ever said to you, you know, you remind me of someone? Well, sometimes when you see someone in someone else, that may be a little prophetic message from the Holy Spirit. Sometimes when we see someone in someone else, it may be, there may be a word of encouragement for that person. And there's a bit of a biblical precedence for this. When we go to the story of how Elisha receives the double portion from Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 2. Elisha knows that Elijah's days are numbered. And Elijah's being pretty low-key about this, and Elisha has to kind of push him to say, hey, you know, I know you're, you're heading out of here soon. I know that your days are numbered, and I want a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah says, well, you know, he basically says, well, it's, it's not really mine to give, but let me see what I can do. And so um, Elisha and Elijah have this, this encounter where then effectively Elisha does receive the double portion. And as Elisha is returning to the camp of prophets, they can see him from afar. And from afar, they can say, the prophets know that Elisha has received the double portion. Well, how did they know that? Well, first of all, they're prophets, so that definitely helps. But there was a couple things that happened because Elisha was starting to look like Elijah. Number one, he had his mantle. And number two, he performed his first miracle. So Elisha was starting to look a lot like Elijah. So that's the biblical precedent we use for sometimes we can have an encounter with someone and what we see in that person speaks to their destiny, speaks to what God wants to do. Let me tell you a couple stories. So one time, I was out with a friend. And we were having coffee. And she was sitting by this window. And when she looked out the window, just the way the light was falling on her face, she looked a lot like Helen Mirren. Helen Mirren was the actress in the movie called The Queen. And so this, this friend of mine, this one glimpse, looked like The Queen. And it was so striking, I just knew somehow inside there was a word of encouragement there. And I thought, what could the word of encouragement be if someone looks like the queen? And I, I was kind of a little bit distracted in the conversation. The queen, queen, what could that mean? Because often God speaks through symbols, and we need to interpret those symbols. We know um, at Pentecost, Peter says the prophecy of Joel is fulfilled. All will have my spirit, young men will dream dreams, and old men will have visions. In other words, God's going to speak to people, speak to all mankind, but through symbols, because that's visions and dreams have a lot of symbols in them. So what do you think? If someone looks like royalty, what do you think God is saying? So I said to my friend, I said, you know, I just have this sense that God wants to speak to you about the dignity you have in him, especially as a woman. And she looked at me, she goes, how did you know that? That's exactly, you know, what God seems to be saying to me as I, as I pray and seek him. I said, well, I, you know, I just kind of a sense I had. I, I just, you know, I just, yeah, I just kind of had this sense. God wants to encourage his people. And we don't necessarily need a word from God to encourage. There are people in our lives who, who are down on themselves who have low self-esteem because they don't see the dignity they have in God. That's a message for everyone. You don't need a prophetic word. I don't need a prophetic word to tell you how amazingly precious you are in the Father's eyes. No matter what you've done, no matter what you've said, no matter what you haven't done, you're precious. Here's another example. 
Um, there's there's a, a chap in the office who I often pray for, and um, and he's very open to having spiritual conversations. He doesn't he doesn't embrace the Christian worldview, but he's very open to talking about spiritual things. And one day, and he, and I've shared some messages I've had for him. And one day he said, "Chris, what's the message today?" And so I asked God, and uh, here I've I've kind of changed the names a little bit to respect people's privacy, but. I basically got a surname, let's say Smith, okay? So I said, today's word is Smith. Does that mean anything to you? And he said, well, I, I was out with my buddy Frank Smith last week. I hadn't seen him in a while. I said, well, sometimes what happens is, sometimes the way God works, not always, but, you know, that person might be, uh, might be a symbol of something that God has in his heart for you. Is there... Is there anything positive about this man um, that, would, that would inspire you? And he said, he said, yeah, I want his life. Like he's, he's a family man, but he's also, he's been able to still find a way to kind of do his sports. He goes, I'm kind of into some, you know, extreme-ish type sports, and I, I, but I really want to start a family, but I'm not sure that I, I can still have this kind of lifestyle and have kids. And so I said to him, I think God the Father is saying, Yes, yes, you can have a family and still have this lifestyle. And God is encouraging you today that, that he, he knows, he knows your needs, he knows your desires. He has a wonderful plan for your life. He wants you to turn to him and trust him and seek his guidance. So, I don't, you know, I don't need a, a prophetic word for you to tell you the same thing, that God has this wonderful destiny for you. He's got, he's placed these things in your heart that speak to what he would have you do. I don't, I don't need a special message from God to tell you that. In, in a situation like that where you get a prophetic word, it's, it definitely gets the person's attention. Right? And that's part of what God wants to do too. He's very gentle, but he'd really like to get our attention and we know that he needs to do that because we have so much going on in our lives. And sometimes he'll go out of his way to get our attention because the message is so important that you have this wonderful dignity in him and that he has a destiny. There's things he wants you to do. And so let's turn to the Father. Father, we thank you for the wonderful um, affection that you have for us and all that is in your heart for us, God, including things you'd have us do, the wonderful destiny. Father, show us. We're open to hearing from you. We're, we're really anxious to hear from you, to hear what your plans are, for we know that they are good. As Jeremiah says, not plans for disaster, but plans for our good. So, Father, we just ask you to open our ears and our eyes to see what you're saying and see what you're doing so that we can embrace it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We invite you to send your prayer request to Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. We receive many prayer requests at Food for Life. Some people have been praying for many years for their loved ones for a certain situation. Others are facing a sudden, catastrophic, life-changing situation. So often I'm inspired by the faith of these people, by their trust in the Lord as they wait on Him. Trusting in the Lord can be quite a challenge. It's not always an easy thing to do. I myself am guilty at times of focusing on the problem at hand and becoming anxious rather than taking my focus off the problem, focusing on the Lord, trusting in Him, and experiencing his peace. But that's just what we need to do when we encounter a difficult situation. It's not easy to trust in the Lord, but that's what we need to do. And I don't say that lightly or flippantly, but anxiety is so counterproductive. I think of the words of Jesus in Luke 12, 25. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a cubit to his span of life? So anxiety is just counterproductive for us. 
I remember a situation in my own life a number of years ago. It was a very stressful situation. I had gone beyond anxiety into fear. And I was sitting at home praying in my living room. And I was anxious, fearful, and then I was angry at myself for not trusting the Lord and experiencing His peace. And there was just all this turmoil. And I was just wishing and praying that I would get a word from the Lord, a word of comfort. And out of the blue, my eldest daughter came bursting into the room and said, Mommy, I just forgot. I made something for you at school. Here it is. And she handed me a bookmark and ran off. And I looked at the bookmark, and it was a picture of Jesus. And the words below said, Even when you are afraid, I am with you. And it was such a timely word for me and just what I needed to hear. The reality is, is that we do go through some anxiety and fear, if we're going to be completely honest. And Jesus is with us through the fear, through the anxiety. But he does not want us to remain there. He wants us to take our focus off the problem, which creates anxiety, and place our focus on Him, trust in Him, because He Himself is our peace. Isaiah 26.3 says, Thou dost keep Him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on Thee, because He trusts in Thee. You know, God sees the big picture. We only see a little snippet, but He sees the beginning from the end. So when we lean our, on our insight, we can get very very confused. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding or insight. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. If there's something you're facing today, and you need prayer, and you need just some help just to trust in the Lord and receive His peace, please, we'd love to pray with you. We count it a privilege to pray with you for your prayer requests. And I leave you with these words from Philippians 4 and 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and He will keep your hearts and minds in perfect peace. For an audio CD or video DVD of today's ministry, we invite you to write to us. When you write, mention the program number 1456 and today's topic, Father Mark Goring on St. Peter Had Faults Too. Food for Life is a nonprofit Catholic charity funded only by donations from viewers. To help us continue this Catholic television ministry, please send your tax deductible donation to Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. If every viewer gave a loony or a toony each week, all expenses would be met. If you have never donated before, we ask that you make your check payable to Food for Life, and our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. You may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. Thanks to your faithful prayers and tax-deductible financial support, Food for Life is the longest-running Catholic television program in Canada. On the next edition of Food for Life, from the Catholic Charismatic Center in Houston, Texas, Father Mark Goring continues with his teaching on St. Peter Had Faults Too. There's a great virtue in life of being able to keep going, even after you fall, to be able to get up and keep going. A person who's able to do that will get far in life. We would like to thank you for your financial support of the Food for Life television ministry. Food for Life is funded only by viewers like yourself. We have no commercial sponsors. Your tax-deductible donations help pay for production of the program, pay the television station for the time that the program is on the air, and pay for the mailing of our monthly newsletter. Thank you again for your support of this Catholic television ministry.